Welcome folks. This is Friday, February 16th, and we are having a joint meeting this afternoon with House Corrections and Institutions Committee and Senate Institutions Committee. And we're going to be spending our time getting updates on the Waterbury Dam <clears throat> project. We've been working on this for a number of years. Um, just to remind folks, we put in in the cash area 4.5 million, and that would was anticipated to finish the project over the next few years. It wasn't going to be done in one fiscal year. It was over the next, I think it was up until 26, 27 was the target date at this point. So um, the Department of Environmental Conservation came to us and wanted to give us an update, and we decided to have a joint meeting. So we also have um, members of the Senate Institutions Committee here. So we, thank you, Madam Chair, for the invite. We appreciate it very much. Welcome to our to our room upstairs. Thank you. Um, so we're going to start with the Commissioner of DEC, Jason Bachelor. Welcome, and you're going to introduce your testimony, and then the folks are going to talk. And we do have a document. First, we do have a document. It's on our House of Corrections and Institutions webpage. I don't know if it's also been posted to the Senate Institutions page or not. It so. will be if it hasn't already. Okay. Do we want to put this up on the screen when we're ready? Uh, ben is going to run the slides. Yeah. And okay. so Very good. Thank you. So, Commissioner, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Madam Chair. Yes, this is your first time, I think, in our committee. It certainly is. It, it's. Um, Wonderful to see you all. Yes, yes. And I, I think that's one of the main reasons why the secretary asked me to, to intro, at least, is so I could meet everyone. Um, my name is Jason Batchelder, and I'm the new DEC commissioner as of uh, late September, formerly uh, director of the warden service and 20-year uh, agency employee, but in a new role here. And, and very gracious that you uh, accepted our invite to host us here today. And um, I think you'll be, I think you'll be, um, wrapped by this compelling testimony you'll hear from from Ben and and Neil's team Eric um, you'll hear from Neil you'll hear from Eric and you'll hear from Ben um, in case you haven't met them Neil's the the director of the of the WID the water investment division Eric's the chief of engineering Ben's the chief of the dam set uh, dam he is the dam the dam the the section dams. chief <laughs> there are many many jokes that that I think I'm missing out on when I we introduce them. The yeah, I I think I think I need to just sit down and write them, write them all down. I'm not, but no. I've been asked that. I've been asked that. I think she may be the only one. And Madam Chair, did you tell them for people who are here first time we have an initiation? Well, that's why the second time. Yeah, that's for the first time, right? Right. Um, but um, uh, you're, you seem to be very familiar with, with the, the, the amount that I think the ultimate amount um, may wiggle a little bit. We're ultimately looking in the, in the realm of, of between 66 and $94 million for this, uh, for this ultimate price tag. Um, certainly by the end of, of 2027, when we hope to begin, that will have uh, been a moving target. Um, this ask is tied to significant state liability in, in the way of, 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 of the obvious. Um, this dam is, is performing as it should, and Ben will get into that, but there are, there are we, aren't, we aren't without concern. Um, so, committee, so. that 68 to 94 million is not all. Uh, <laughs> we've been working with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, there was a lot of upfront cost in terms of the study and assessment in terms of how, and then you get into the actual construction. So that 4.5 million that was put aside is not going to be expended in one fiscal year. We were banking. Correct. <clears throat> um, and I, I think what, what I moved into is some of the, the work that's led up to and, and the work that we still have to do to get to that number. So I, I won't take up any more air in the room. I realize it's Friday. Ben will, will be next, I think. And um, I appreciate the attention and I think you won't have any trouble giving it to them. It's very, uh, very interesting topic. So, uh, Ben, all yours. Thank you so much for having us. Are there any questions of the committee? Oh, please. In the hut. <laughs> the senators want to speak. Just raise your hand. In the same order that I call on House members. Yeah. 
So thank you. Thank you for having us. Back at any time. Oh, please. I'd love to. <laughs> I want to talk to Eric Black. Yeah. <laughs> that seat could actually be hot. Welcome <laughs> back, Ben. You were here at the beginning of the week. Thank you very much. <laughs> If you could also identify yourself for the record. Uh, for, for the record, my name is uh, Ben Green. I'm the section chief, a dam safety engineer at the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation Dam Safety Program. And I'm here today to provide a briefing on the Waterbury Dam Spillway Project. Um, this drone photograph here in this cover photo is of the, the dam from the upstream side. The spillway, which is largely the subject of this project, you can see on the left side of this photo, you can see the three uh, gray steel gates on the far most left area of this photograph. Um, those are the flood gates. And then the, to the right of that, you can see the concrete spillway. Then the remainder of the dam, the embankment section, and the white gatehouse you can see on, on top of the crest. Um, so I just want to, again, introduce the, the Waterbury Dam Spillway team. Uh, the dam is owned by the state of Vermont. Uh, we have operational responsibilities that was delegated to us in the Water Investment Division Dam Safety Program. Uh, Neil, and, Neil and Eric, uh, who, who you know and were introduced to, um, are, are largely performing um, the financial and project oversight. And again, I'm, I'm Ben Green. I'm doing the dam safety work, the lead owner operator, as well as technical oversight uh, for the project. Um, we are very fortunate to be teamed with the Army Corps of Engineers New England District uh, on this project. Um, they're providing both technical oversight and financial assistance. I'm going to spend a lot of this uh, presentation going through some of the technical elements and kind of where we've been and where we're going to. And then Neil's going to step in and go through some of the financials uh, at the end of the presentation. So just an overview of Waterbury Dam for those not familiar. Uh, the drainage basin or area that flows to the dam is 109 square miles. Um, it's uh, bounded to the north by the peak of Mount Mansfield, to the west by the Green Mountain Range, and to the east by the Worcester Range. The dam is 187 feet tall and 2,100 feet long. That makes it the third tallest dam in the state and the fourth largest in terms of storage capacity, and it's the largest state-owned dam uh, that we have. It has three primary purposes. Uh, purpose number one is flood protection, reduction in the Winooski Basin. Uh, number two is hydropower. Uh, Green Mountain Power has a five megawatt power plant tied into the dam. And number three is recreation. Um, there's Little River Campground, a, little, a Waterbury Day Use Center, as well as uh, several public ramps and access points make this a very popular uh, place in the summertime. Uh, the dam is rated as a high hazard potential dam. That means in the event of a dam failure or uncontrolled release, uh, the result in probable loss of life. Uh, based on current estimates, um, we have a population at risk, which is basically the number of people estimated to be within the potential inundation zone of a failure um, at 5,000 people with a potential life loss between 800 and 900 people during a, if we had a, an incident during a flood event uh, with uh, monetary losses approaching 850 million. Um, approximately 1,400 structures could be damaged. And just to give you some further context, uh, perhaps you're familiar with the State Emergency Operations Center in downtown Waterbury. Uh, that could be under as much as 40 feet of water if we were to have a failure to stand during a flood event. And the Waterbury Complex. And the Waterbury Complex nearby. Could be under how much feet? 40 feet. Uh, the, the dam has an ex estimated annual flood benefit of $3.5 million. Um, the dam was built following the 1927 flood. It was designed by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, much of the labor was provided by the CCC. The dam was completed in 1938 along with its sister dams, Wrightsville, which is just upstream here of Montpelier, and Eastbury Dam, upstream of uh, Berry City. Um, the spillway consists of two main parts, and this photograph in the lower right kind of shows that pretty well with the zoomed-in photograph. You can see the floodgates on the left side of this image. And the uh, concrete spillway to the right. Um, these elevations are listed here just to kind of give you reference. Uh, elevation 592 is the base of the gates, and elevation 617 and a half is the top of the concrete spillway. That 25 and a half feet is our flood control band at the facility. Um, due to some issues and challenges with the structure that we've talked about, we can only handle, handle about 75% of that, so we can only go to 610.8 uh, for an elevation in this reservoir before we start to uh, not be able to do full flood control. Um, and then just another useful image in this uh, slide here is um, in the center here is, is a, a cut image of, of one of the stainer gates or radial arm gates uh, and how they work. They're essentially, they're very simple. They're just large doors um, on the concrete bridge above uh, is the lifting equipment, which is a cable that goes down and attaches to the lower part of the gate. And the gate is supported on a hinge called a trunnion on the downstream side. And, the, and it's simply a winch inside that 
or hoist inside that building that lifts the front of the edge of the gate up into the upper position, which is shown here in dash. So that's how we operate them. They simply just rotate upwards and downwards into position. So before you leave that screen, the elevation between the 617.5 feet and the 633, yes. what you're saying because of the structure and the age of the dam, for flood stage right now, would it be 617 is where you'd be concerned or 610? 610.8. Uh, I'll get more into that in subsequent slides, but the structure was originally designed such that we hold a flood pool from 592 to 617 and a half, at which point water starts to flow over the uncontrolled over the auxiliary spillway. Um, and then we start to do some gate operations to start discharging water. Um, right now, we hit elevation 610.8, we have to start doing that. So it's at prior to the designs, about 75% of the design load. So when we had the flooding with Irene, when we had the event with Irene, then we had the event this summer. Yes. How high did it get? I have some slides where I'll, I'll go through oh. those elevations. Um, I guess the short answer to that, though, is that I think we've had, um, you know, Irene's a good example. We had spring of, of, of 2011. We had two flood events, actually December flood event this year. And I'll go through all this, but we've had more high pools more recently than we've had in the 85-year history of the facility. So doing more work now than it ever has. So we do have some questions. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get ahead of your presentation. I just would like to know what the relationship is with Green Mountain Power, whether they have any skin in the game as far as any of the repair costs <laughs> or, or what their relationship is with the dam as far as um, uh, rent or whatever. So if you're going to cover it later, that's fine. Uh, no, I'm not really going to go into that. So Green Mountain Power, as I understand, when the dam was, uh, the project was, 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 was first imagined, Green Mountain Power actually owned a lot of the land that was needed to construct the dam. And so I think they they provide that land to the state and so essentially procure themselves water rights at this at this facility in perpetuity so they there's no we don't have a a lease agreement or an easement with them in that sense and that they've kind of come since the dam was constructed they've been essentially had that right since day one and they built their their um their power plant in the 1950s and um our, we, have, we have a good working relationship with green mountain power at the site um they do not have a uh necessarily a required um uh, uh, position in this project particularly, but they do typically provide, uh, they do provide some staffing assistance to us for maintenance and operations. So that's sort of their input no, that they no provide. Money is, no money's paid to the state for their right to generate power there. Right. Right. No money, yeah, they, there's no money that paid to the state for that. They, they, their input was sort of an initial project. Where were you using their land? We, they, they, yes, they did. I believe Green Mountain Power had cited this site as a potential dam construction area. And then when this project came along, they kind of gave the land to have it, have the state build the dam. So they, they were their first kind of in a way of thinking. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so um, how is this monitored now? Is that a gatehouse of some sort on the top, the white building? Um, at what point is it monitored? I mean, when you're getting a, a, a heavy rainfall, how does that work? Sure. So we, so uh, my, my team monitors the site. We typically visit at least weekly in person. And then we have automated um, water level gauges, both up, there's upstream, they're USGS gauges, both upstream in the watershed as well in the as up downstream and on the water reservoir level itself. So we can monitor those remotely. Uh, we operate the dam in accordance with the Army Corps of Engineers reg regulation manual, which was first developed in the 1970s, updated in 2005. And we follow that manual in terms of, of, of how we operate. Um, the decision to operate the gates is based on actually the water level uh, in the Winooski River uh, across at Brook entrance, which is actually right near the state complex. Mm -hmm. uh, when that hits elevation 417, that's our directive to go and close the gates, um, sometimes dependent on weather and other considerations, we'll close them a little earlier. Um, there's no real disadvantage to that. And then uh, under a normal a flood of moderate size, those gates essentially remain closed until that elevation at, 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 in Waterbury drops below elevation 417, which is two feet from out of bank flooding in Waterbury. And we have a, a discharge schedule where we're not allowed to exceed 2,000 CFS from the gate. Um, in the event we had a very severe, uh, more severe flood than anything we've uh, thankfully seen, um, we would have to start to operate the gate to discharge water. And that's kind of where it gets into that elevation 610.8 or 617 and a half. We get up that high, uh, we have to start discharging water uh, during the storm event and adding additional water to the, the of course, amount of flooding that's already going on. That's Most of that's done remotely. No, that's all done with people on site. Oh, it is. Um, there's no remote operations of this facility. We have to be on site to operate, and um, we have to be on site to do all of those. Oh, very good. Thank you. Good explanation. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it's operating. We can't go all the way up to the other elevation. Now. Is that a function of a problem with the gate itself? It, it is. I have. To, I'll, I'll go through into what what that is exactly. But the gates have 
essentially been deemed structurally deficient since 2005. And, and I have a couple of slides that kind of explain kind of how we got to where we are. Okay, I thought it was there. Oh. So, yeah, I guess the last point I was just going to make is on, on the up photograph on the upper side, there's a, you see the gatehouse, the white gatehouse on the crest of the dam, and there's a red dashed line that goes straight down that intersects a, a dashed line that goes along the, uh, through the dam. That is, that represents a, a spillway tunnel that's 100 feet below the water's level. It's 14 feet wide, 11 foot tall. And that's how water is typically transmitted through the dam and ultimately the Green Mountain Powers facility. They make power and then discharge the water downstream. Uh, once a flood event occurs, the water level rises above and then we start to operate the spillway. So under normal operation, the gates are in the fully open position and, um, and, and the water levels uh, below, below the spillway. So that's how the facility is operated. The majority of the water at normal base flows is through that dashed line that represents a, a tunnel that goes through the dam. Um, this next video is a, it's just a, a, a this next slide is a video of an example flood release uh, from the 2019 spring flood event. This is just meant to give a, some scale for those not familiar with the facility on what a flood operation looks like at the facility, what roughly 1500 CFS going down to the spillway looks like. Um, once we do a gate operation, we close the gates and then we hit the, the criteria to start opening the gates. That's an incremental process. It usually takes us about a week of frequent site visits to of bumping the gate slightly to uh, slowly discharge the reservoir and bring it back in a safe manner to the normal, normal level. I'll play that again. <clears throat> just play that again. <laughs> I go back and reverse. So if this dam was to give, the spillway was to give at the gates, all that water that's back <clears> there. <throat> Correct, the, the water to the base of the gate structure. It is the water that is behind the dam. Is that the piece, is that part used, is that considered like a Waterbury Reservoir and it's used recreational? Yeah, so elevation 589 and a half, I'm sorry to use so much elevation, but 589 and a half elevation is the base elevation for recreation purposes. Elevation 592, a couple feet above that is the, the base cell of the spillway. So under normal conditions, if you were to go out there almost, you know, most days of the year, except for the case of sometimes in the winter when the water level is drawn down, we have a flood event when the water level is up, the elevation is at 589 and a half, it's fairly static, Green Mountain Power, Make, you know, put more water through the turbines uh, when the flows peak up a little bit and less when we're in drought conditions and kind of maintain that consistent five, eight, nine and a half elevation. Of course, we have a flood, uh, the inflows overcome what GMP can put through their facility and then we start to store water in the facility and then we turn to the spillway. How many acres in the reservoir normally? Um, I don't have that number off the top of my head. I have to. I think I have to look that up. I can. Okay. I, I can look that up. Yeah. And the, so there's really only two feet of storage before it hits the spillway. It's correct. Is, yeah. During a anticipated flood event, do you try to get it down any? Uh, no. The the facility is designed to handle what's called the probable maximum flood, which is essentially the worst combination of meteorological and hydrological events that can occur in the drainage basin. So, uh, so there's. The facility is designed to start have a starting elevation at, at, at 589, or actually, frankly, 592. Or, or was that based flood. on the 27 flood? That's based on an analysis. The, the, that's based on a, an analysis that's um, kind of an empirical analysis that, that uh, makes some assumptions as to what, again, what the worst combination of, of rainfall and ground conditions you could possibly have to have the most rain possible. Um, when you are going to, to release and you're, you're worried about, you know, you, you want to get rid of some water, is it um, a requirement that you notify the uh, people in the path of the dam? We, uh, so we do it, we have a ramping schedule, so we don't just go, so in, in 2000 CFS is our maximum, which may sound like a lot, but compared to the amount of water that's in the Winooski, it might be 10 or up to 10%. It's actually a relatively small amount. Um, but we do have a, a process where we have a um, email notification where we notify downstream towns and um, uh, you know, state officials and local officials of, of the operations, as well as we have some um, ties with local recreation folks who use the, use the, use the water. So anytime we do an operation during a flood event, we, we send that out prior to doing it. So people are, are generally aware of what's going on. Wendy. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, when you send it to the municipalities, do you send it to the emergency management directors or to other folks in the 
Uh, it, uh, it's about 45 people on the list in total. I know at Waterbury, I believe we sent it to the fire chief and the town manager. And um, okay. I have to, you know. Sometimes those folks are out of bounds. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an overall project background, again, the project was constructed in 1938, uh, completed in 1938 following the 27 floods. The first major modification came in 1957 where the embankment was raised three feet and the third gate was added, the, the third gate on the, in the bottom photograph, the one on the left, which is which is 35 feet wide. The original two gates are 20 feet wide. This was due to updated uh, hydrologic and hydraulic analyses that were done at that time. Um, in 1985, there was a passive seepage remediation system added to the embankment due to some seepage issues that the dam had. In 2002, there was additional seepage remediation work done that perhaps some of you are familiar with. Um, an active dewatering system was installed in the embankment of the dam at that time that uh, my team operates still to this day. Um, in 2004, during a test operation of the gates, one of the gates uh, jammed in the partially open position. Um, and that was really what prompted the start of this entire project back in, in 2004. Um, in 2004, at that time, they did some temporary repairs that had a, a, a noted 15-year design life. And uh, we're already past that now, but um, to make the gates operable. Um, so the gate uh, jamming issues also prompted a structural study of the analysis of the gates themselves. Um, also during this period, in the mid-1990s, the Folsom Dam in California, which has tainter gates very similar to Waterbury's, the gate, those gates failed, and it was determined during that failure that there's friction that builds up in that trunnion or hinge in, 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 that, that the gate rotates on, and uh, the design guidance from the 30s and 40s did not include that, that frictional component in the design. So Waterbury was analyzed with the potential for if we have frictional buildup in our trunnions, and we were found that our, our system is susceptible to having that. So at that point in 2004, that load restriction was placed on the gate. We were only able to load the gates to 75% of flood control capacity. Um, so that's really the main driver of this project is that we were unable to hold a full flood pool due to the gate, uh, the gates being deficient. Um, the spillway project is also prompted by a water quality certification. When Green Mountain Power was getting their new Federal Energy Regulatory Commission license, um, the, the, there were water quality standards um, placed on the project. And one of them was the elimination of the winter drawdown to improve water quality. Um, but due to our deficient gates, um, the desire was to keep the winter drawdown uh, until the gates were, you know, in good shape enough to code and could handle a full flood pool. So, in theory, the results of this project will be improved O and M, you know, improved structures as well as improved water quality. And the project is funded through, uh, at least partially through Section 1177 of wind funding, uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers having a large cost share. And Neil's going to go through that and in, in, to the end of the presentation. So, project goals are pretty straightforward. Restore flood pool capability, flood, uh, full flood pool capability while reducing dam safety risks. Uh, continue to support hydropower recreational uses and seasonal drawdowns, which should have an improved water quality, and then just improving 85 year old equipment, improved operation, improved maintenance. Um, that's the overall all goals of the project. So we have another question, Wayne. So uh, I recall back in 2004 to the plan period, did you have any uh, permitting problems downstream? Or for a strange flow or anything like that? Is there something on this dam? There was so um, the day to day outflows are controlled by Green Mountain Power through their hydropower facility, and they're under a water quality certification uh, where they have to um, run this uh, run the system as a run of river style system, which was a change for them. Um, where they have to basically they measure the inflows and they 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 put the same amount of water through their turbines and downstream. So. Theoretically, downstream is seeing the same flows as upstream of the dam, so it, it I, operates like a more natural system. Yeah, I understand. So it doesn't have anything to do with this. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's Green Mountain Power. That, that's Green Mountain Power's uh, direct responsibility, but it, I mean, it's all somewhat knitted together, but it, which we are two separate entities at the same facility. Other questions so folks? Uh, Neil just pinged that uh, at, at standard elevation, normal elevation, the reservoir is about 850 acres. So project steps so far, we're, we're, we're following the Army Corps of Engineers uh, process. Um, step one was a risk assessment. A risk assessment is basically an initial step. It was a holistic look at the entirety of the dam. We knew we had these fragilities at the spillway. Um, sure. but the first step was take a step back, actually, and assess the entirety of the dam to make sure there are not any other deficiencies that were of similar or greater risk than the spillway was. To make sure we were putting, you know, funds after the highest risk element with the dam. And the risk assessment came out that in fact, we were, this the high spillway is in fact the most highest risk element of the dam. So essentially, um, you know, prove that this was the, probably the project worth doing. Um, step number two, which we're currently in now and kind of getting towards the latter stages of is the dam safety modification study. 
Uh, this included additional spillway assessment work and engineering, field data collection, engineering analysis, uh, partial design, or at, or the 10% design was recently completed, and cost estimating. So hopefully by the end of 2024, we'll be at the 30% design phase and 30% cost estimate. But right now, largely what we're reporting to you is the results of the 10% design and 10% cost estimate. Uh, you know, is that calendar year or state fiscal year? That's calendar year. <laughs> So hopefully early 25 will start design um, will be will be upcoming. Uh, they've estimated a two year period for design. So 25 to 2027, again, this is calendar year and then construction during the starting in the 2027 construction season and going through the 2029 construction season. So that at this point, that is the plan schedule. We don't have an event before that. Mm -hmm. Agree. All right, what, what will happen if, if one of those gates fails or you can't open it. I mean, this, that could be a real possibility. We've got six more years, five more years. So we were actually uh, implementing some temporary, um, I have a slide about this later, we're actually implementing some temporary uh, improvements to the, the most fragile gate and the spillway bridge to uh, improve operability and reliability, at least in the interim until this project can, can occur. Um, to, to the Madam Chair's point, um, if one of those don't open, is there a natural spillway after the fact? I mean, is there a natural runway that can go if it actually breaches the dam before it just starts come pouring over the top? Is there a lower section on this side of that? So, so if we're so, I guess in a situation where we're, we're unable to open any of the gates, um, which we have, um, you know, we have, we have backup plans in, in place, uh, and that's why one of the reasons why we have to open the like six ten point eight is that number that we would start to open the gates, which it should be six seventeen and a half. Why we have that seventy five percent load restriction is we do not want to get more than that much load on a gate because after that point it's been determined it, they may have difficulty in operation. So we would actually sort of prematurely start operating the gates if we were to get to a flood of that level and discharging water downstream. If if for some reason the gates didn't operate under that scenario. Um, in terms of discharging water downstream, the water level would rise. We'd spill over the auxiliary spillway on the right side. Um, we also do have a cone valve at the downstream end of the dam that can discharge about 600 CFS. Frankly, during a flood event, it's a bit of a drop in the bucket, but those are, are really convenient ways to convey water out. Um, you know, again, we're implementing some temporary improvements to the, to the gates and things to uh, you know, improve the reliability in the short term. So... The worst case, you talk 40 feet water over water barrier, that, that would be if the whole structure failed? Correct. So if a single one of these gates failed, mm -hmm. then it would be a lesser impact. It would be a much lesser impact if we had one gate fail. It's unlikely all three would fail at once. But yes, if we had a single gate failure, uh, those numbers I quoted were, were sort of a worst case scenario. If we had a single gate failure, we'd be looking at a lesser downstream impacts. So structurally, if you couldn't get the gates open and the thing overtopped, Structurally, what's the estimate of the probability that you could have a complete failure? Um, Structural failure. The entire dam overtops. Yeah. I mean that 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 would be those those would that would be near the numbers I gave would be that sort of worst case scenario. Um, the gates, an individual gate failing, those population at risk numbers and loss loss of life numbers are much much lower. So you think if it, if it overtopped the dam, you could blow out on all those gates. Uh, try the truth of the matter is is that the the, the the structural fragility with the gates is associated with with operating them under a load is actually picking them up is the problem not them being stationary in place so when the gates are in the closed position they are stable under flood condition um, the analysis just show that when we need to operate them that that's when the problem arises yeah. um, so just to review some of the completed ongoing work um, the risk to go a little bit more detail into the risk assessment um, again, the risk assessment proved that the spillway holds the greatest risk for the project and uh, so it's a sensible investment. Um, we looked to actually start out by doing what's called a potential failure mode analysis where we looked at over 50 potential failure modes for the dam, not including the spillway, but just different ways the dam could possibly fail. Roughly five were selected from that uh, of ones that seemed like the highest probability of occurring. And then of those five, by far the most, the highest risk one was the Tainer Gate failure. Um, it's kind of in determination of all of that. Um, some of the things that we learned was that um, the pedestrian bridge that provides access to this, the gates as well as supports the Hoyt system is overstressed even under normal operations. We learned that the center gate is overstressed also during normal operations is by far the most stressed, though actually the gates on the right and left are far better condition than the one in the center. Uh, we, we, we learned, continue to learn that the, um, 
but there's moving movement and tilting of the piers underneath the bridge that have originally that's actually what called the caused the gate jamming as well as this caused some of the issue caused some of the issues that we have and sort of a new issue that arose was that um, we're actually having some we knew we were having some level of uh, bedrock uh, uh, erosion downstream of the spillway um, and I'll, I'll go into more on that but um, that was sort of a new finding was that that was a that was potential failure mode for the dam um, so. Uh, in 2022, we did a bunch of field work with the Army Corps of Engineers. The program of, of ex, uh, subsurface explorations of bedrock and concrete was performed. This was done to support the, to evaluate the quality of the concrete in the dam, as well as underlying bedrock, which also supported the erodibility of bedrock analysis that was done downstream of the spillway. We also performed what's called trunnion friction testing. Um, this image on the right shows it pretty well. Um, essentially, we uh, a company came and you can see these red boxes and red wires. Um, they instrumented all three of the gates and we operated them under uh, you know, kind of different situations and they measured that was through that they were able to calculate the friction building up in the trunnions which are the orange circled hinges in the back of the gate um, and through that analysis that we learned that actually gate one is, is better off than we thought and gate three is better off than we thought but gate two is worse off than we thought. So just to be clear if it was a failure when lifting up one of those gates mm -hmm. that would be those red circles that trunnion friction area is what would fail. What would actually fail is that these be able to work. These strut arms right here would buckle. Okay. Uh, what would happen is that the, the, there's a cable attached to the leading edge of the gate, and we, we would start picking up, and the hoist has the capacity to pick the gate. The essentially what would happen is the trunnions wouldn't, wouldn't rotate on the trunnions as designed, and we put a lot more load into the strut arms, and we buckle a strut arm. That that's the leading concern is a buckling strut arm. So, uh, do we get a, a normal? Um, deterioration of concrete involved or, or is there a special concrete that's being used to avoid that? We, we, we have, uh, we, the concrete deterioration is, is a size for this site as well. Yep, and I'll, I'll go into that in a subsequent okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. So are we under any pressure from the Army Corps of Engineer to, I mean, <clears throat> we're, this is part of, is this part of their dam structure as well? The Army Corps, I know we're working with them. Right. It's federal dollars. Right. Are we under any pressure from them to do the work quicker, or are we pretty much? No, no, no. Um, they, th their sense of risk is a little bit different. They, they compare, you know, when they compare risk, they compare it to their national portfolio of dams, and they have dams at the national level that are worse off than this one. So from their standpoint, okay. this project, right. while it's still uh, <laughs> an important project, it probably wouldn't rise to the next the top of their list. Um, when they rank it nationally with some of the other projects they have and the risk portfolios they have, of course, they have dams upstream of tremendously populated areas compared to Vermont. So, um, but um, again, they're very supportive of our temporary risk reduction measures that we're taking to, you know, again, improve temp do temporary improvements until the project. Um, but they're, um, there was not, that was not a mandate by them or anything. That was a decision that was made by us that that was something that needed to be done and might need to be spent at the state level to, to do that. So, Neil, you had your hand up. Please. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Neil Kamen, Director of Water Investment Division. I uh, just wanted to compliment what Ben was saying about the Army Corps by noting that they are truly an excellent partner in this. They are there with us 100% of the way. They're not driving the bus, but they are, they're not holding the bus up either. Uh, they have a, a design team fully arranged and assembled for this work right now. Um, and then they are on speed dial, but they've been very, very responsive. Um, so I just wanted to make sure folks in the committee knew that that partnership is very strong. So the staff that's there, is that under the state or is that under Army Corps? That's under the state. The dam is owned by the state and operated by the state. So our, our staff covers this facility. Um, some other completed and ongoing work. Um, there was a bridge inspection. Uh, again, the bridge supports both the hoist equipment as well for the gates as well as access. Um, there was load rating for the gate, and there was also uh, tilt monitoring that was done on the piers. And these images kind of kind of say it all. Um, the condition of the concrete is poor. We took samples of the concrete. Um, in some areas, it didn't even attain its original design strength, which was even was low by modern standard. Um, and then. The images on the right here kind of show that what's occurring is what's called alkali silica reaction, which is a reaction in the concrete that makes it expand. And that expansion of concrete is putting a lateral load on the piers and pushing the piers out of you know, vertical plumb. Um, and that's what the image in the lower right hand corner shows is, is that offset, that's how much offset has occurred in the pier, which when you're working with a gate with fairly tight tolerances, that's problematic. And then uh, the other kind of the other finding was related to the spillway uh, bedrock erosion. 
Um, the dish bedrock channel was, was blasted out of bedrock. This was a hillside prior to the dam being constructed uh, in the 1930s, um, but they blasted the rock out to make the, take the spillway. Um, typical flow releases can be as much as 2,000 CFS uh, out of the spillway, and we have, a, we have documented rock erosion that's occurred over the last 85 years. Um, keep in mind, if we had that much larger flood and we had to do a major discharge where we had to open multiple gates, we could be putting out as much as 80,000 CFS. So um, continued rock erosion at 2,000 CFS versus, versus a, a high flood load to 80,000 CFS raised a lot of concerns about the stability of the bedrock to support the gates and support good operation in a major flood. So it's, that was noted. Um, we have a question. It's yeah. not hard bedrock then. It's, uh... it's pretty poor quality bedrock. Um, this whole site is built on um, essentially poor quality bedrock. That was the poor quality bedrock. I mentioned in the early 2000s, we had that um, seepage project that was done. That was really also a project related to the poor bedrock. Under seepage of this dam has been problematic and it's largely due to the poor bedrock conditions. And unfortunately, the spillway, we have the same same rock. So there's a continuation of a different problem kind of showing itself in a different way. You think about it, it's been there for over 80 years. You've had mm -hmm. a lot of water pressure coming down there that's going to wear wear it away over time. In, in, indeed. But I guess in comparison, we have East Ferry and Wrightsville, which have also had the same service histories and have had none of these problems. So yeah. um, this this dam has had more, more issues. But you shouldn't have too much sand or anything for abrasive them down. Get a lot of turbidity in the dam in the in the column. Um, at times during flood conditions, you can, but um, the, the the bedrock is just fairly highly erodible, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I take a, take a quick step back, and I want to do an overview of the 2023 flood events at the facility, of which we had two. Um, for people are very familiar with the July flood event, uh, we reached a peak pool elevation of 604.33. That's six and a half feet below that action level where we'd had to, would have had to start kind of pre-operating the gates. Um, but for just for context, in terms of project history, that was the fourth highest pool that we've ever experienced at the facility. Um, and then in December, um, we had that regional flood of several inches that was on top of snowpack. Uh, this has Mount Mansfield and the Green Mountains in its drainage basin. So we actually had a decent snowpack here. So our runoff here was higher than most other places. And we actually ended up reaching the sixth pool of record just a few tenths of a foot below um, the July event. So those are both um, you know, high events. And, and sort of the other takeaway here is that if you look at the project history and the high pools, um, we had the fourth and the sixth and highest pool in 2023, but the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth have all occurred in the last 12 years of the 85-year service history of this facility. So you know, we're essentially asking this to do this facility to do more than we ever had at this, this point in its, in its life in its life cycle. Um, and then just about our flood operation channel, uh, flood operation challenges. Um, we have those load restrictions on the gates that have been on there since 2004. Um, we, we know that our bridge and gate two are overstressed. Um, and we know that uh, that essentially leaves us with our cone valve and gate three for water releases during a major flood. So during, during the July flood and the December flood, those were sufficient. But, um, you know, during a larger flood, we have to make a tough call to operate, you know, pre-operate gate one and two. So, um, so that brings us to our temporary risk reduction project. This is a state-driven initiative. Um, the Corps is very, very supportive of it, but didn't require it. Um, but, you know, following what we learned about the fragility in the center gate and the fragility in the, the bridge, uh, we've worked with a consultant and PC construction, and we're working on shoring both of them. The image in the upper left-hand corner is uh, we're, we're plating the strut arms on the center gate, the weakest element in the system. Oh, so, sorry. That was completed right around Christmas time. Um, and so that gate is now capable, is back to being able to be operated um, up to elevations 10.8, back to the original 75% load restriction. Um, the, the bridge, we're going to be un, uh, underpinning, technically overpinning it with uh, steel steel beams cast across the top and bottom of the bridge and, and, and basically connecting them. Um, that that project is, uh, that part of the project is hopefully going to start very soon and hopefully before the spring runoff. Um, and this design and construction of these temporary measures uh, has been a, a budget of about $727,000. And again, this should, this should basically get us the operability that we need back to our back to our operability before we learned everything that we learned back to that just that 75 percent load restriction we'd still be able to operate all three gates up to that point so now for the permanent project the one that's coming uh the one that's coming uh these are the recommended rehabilitation measures by the army corps of engineers um first starting with the gates so the gates are numbered here in this image gate one and two are the original 1927 uh, 1938 gates those are going to be replaced in, in their entirety um gate number three uh, which was put on in the 1950s. That one is going to be refurbished. 
Uh, that's the first part of the project. The second part will be uh, removal of the entirety of the hoist equipment and the existing bridge and replacement with a new bridge to modern code and to vehicle widths. Um, that'll give us a lot of um, a, a lot better chance when we have to do uh, maintenance on the equipment. It's very hard to get in and out of there because all this pedestrian access right now, as well as bring the bridge up to the, the capability to safely handle the load of the gates. Um, the entirety of the concrete in the system has suffered alkali silica reactions, so that concrete will be chipped back to solid concrete, which is estimated to be you know six to eight inches of concrete removal throughout the entire system and replacement of, with new concrete surfaces. And then um, downstream of the spillway, this blue um, shaded area will have a uh, the concrete will be removed down about six feet, and then a concrete apron will be uh, placed there to arrest that concrete, uh, the bedrock erosion. So the total project cost, based on the ten percent design by the Corps of Engineers. Their best number right now is 79 million with an estimated range of 60, roughly 67 to 95 uh, million uh, to complete this work. Um, other elements of the work will, be, will include a reservoir drawdown. Um, during this work, we'll need to provide equivalent flood protection to what we can provide now. And the only way to do that is a drawdown that will probably persist for the majority of the duration of the project, which has been estimated again about two years. And then just also you know, quite a bit of access issues here. It's a very difficult site to get to and get meaningfully sized equipment to do the work to. So there's going to be Quite a bit of access road construction and things like that just to just to get set up so when were these these cost estimates put in place was it recently or yes there? okay it's into january this um that's what kind of prompted this need for an update uh was was these up these 10 percent uh oh you need more state money coming into coming into park <laughs> Troy and then Chip. can i just get a quick sense from you about what that two-year drawdown looks like ecologically like, how does it look downstream? How does it look at the reservoir? So we don't quite, it's, we haven't, it's going to be a design drawdown. I, don't, I can't tell you what exactly the number is going to be yet. Um, it could be in the 30 to 50 foot range. Um, it would be a controlled um, either through our cone valve or through GMP's um, equipment. That's not entirely clear yet either. Um, it would probably be a, about a two-year uh, two year duration uh, during that time. I think it would be managed similar to how it is now where inflow would equal outflow to the extent that you're able to do that. But once you start to have increased inflows, Rather than closing gates and storing it up higher, it'll essentially be stored in the drain part of the reservoir. So it will uh, somewhat perform similarly in that regard. Okay. <clears throat> um, are we at a point for, to put out an RFP on this or for construction? Or yeah, or is oh. there already one? No, no, we're, we're we're still a ways away from that. We need to. Yeah. Um, we were at ten percent design. There's going to be a thirty percent design as part of the dam safety modification study. That will essentially set forth all the parameters that need final design, then final design will be done over a two year period, and then it will be put out, um, you know, put out through the Army Corps of Engineers for, for bids. So we're still a long, pretty long ways away from construction bidding. Construction is not scheduled to start until 2027. So, thank you. Yes, the design, if you go back to one of your page eight, page seven, your design is not due to start until 2025, Correct. which is next year, and goes yes. on yeah. for two years. Correct. And then the the Corps is a great partner, but they're not very fast. Uh, John. Depends on what's happening. I think somewhere I saw that there was some seepage in the earthen part. Is there any, is that any concern or are we doing anything about it? Yes, the seepage was evaluated during that initial risk assessment. Uh, we have an active dewatering system in the dam and a passive de uh, pa active dewatering and a passive collection system in the dam. That's largely when I say we go on a weekly basis. That's largely what we're doing is monitoring that system and making adjustments to that system. Um, this dam has unfortunately been somewhat plagued by a, a, a history of seepage issues, so we keep a very close eye on it. And at the moment, the passive and active systems are very effective. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's kind of something we continually monitor. Not putting you on the spot, but is the risk of, of failure more acute in the earthen part or in the gate part? It's in the gate part. That's what the risk is. That's the whole objective of doing the risk assessment. The risk assessment was to point us to the highest risk part of the dam, to make sure that you're putting like limited funds to buy down the riskiest element. So yeah. that's why that was done initially um, to sort of make sure we had our, we were our site targeted on the right, the right thing. And that's okay. came back to the spillway. Mr. Green, um, typically uh, maybe, maybe it's somebody else that answers this question, but typically what do you see as far as state's portion of, of that money? Is it an 80, 10, or 80, 20, 90, 10? What do we see as far as segues to, to Neil's part of the, Sure. Anyone have any other technical questions, but just this is on to Neil's part with the yep. financing part. Uh, so do we have any more technical questions? Okay, great. Let's do this. Thanks, 
So good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to be here. Neil Kamen, Director of Water Investment Division, as I said before. Uh, before I jump into the, the, the slide on the funding and the work we're doing along those lines, just want to kind of say that I sleep better at night knowing that we've got him at the helm and you all should too. Um, it's an amazing piece of infrastructure. I'm always stunned when I have a chance to see it. Eric here has had the idea for some time and maybe mentioned to you, Madam Chair, about doing a kind of a joint field visit with you all up there at some point you when it was convenient. last year. There was a visit. There was one that was the one that was done. We had scheduled one a little bit ago, a couple, three years ago when we were first launching the project. Yeah. We could do it on a nice spring day. Wait till May. June. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 I'll follow you. <laughs> I'm not leaving. <laughs> the, um, the photographs that Ben showed, you know, do it justice and they don't at the same time. The scale is, is remarkable when you are on top and looking down or below and looking up. So. Um, I'm just here to chat a little bit about the funding details. Uh, Senator Ingalls will, should be able to answer oops, your question here. Um, so as Ben said, the current construction cost estimate is somewhere between high 60s and low 90s in terms of millions of dollars. And these are fresh numbers from the Army Corps based on their, they have a classification for their cost estimates. Hopefully they don't escalate further as we get through design, but it, I'll just be honest, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me, Ben. Um, they have a pretty big range on here, but also would probably surprise yeah. So I'm going to be talking about a couple different um, areas of funding, and I'm going to make reference to the Water Resources Development Act, WERDA. It's federal, uh, federal um, both authorization and appropriation that happens every two years. WERDA is um, kind of considered must-pass legislation. It's also typically highly bipartisan, and that's why we never, ever, ever hear about it. Um, but it typically passes every couple of years by hook or by crook. Um, and so WERDA is our friend. Senator Sanders uh, has a significant amount of leverage over what happens in WERDA. Um, so that is good. Um, the work that the Corps is doing now is authorized by the Water Resources Development Act. It's in Section 1177. And Section 1177 has an authorization ceiling right now of $60 million. So what that means is that's the maximum federal appropriation that could go into this. Let me get through the slide, previewing that there'll be questions, and then we'll kind of come back through each, each bit. So authorization ceiling is 60. The current appropriation is 40 million. That's how much federal money that we've got available to us in the bank. We also have what is called a new construction start awarded to us by the U.S. Army Corps uh, three years ago. That is what enabled us to feel comfortable actually signing the project agreement. Um, a new construction start is essentially solid gold. If you don't have it, the Corps will not work on your project, no matter how much you want them to do it and how much you're willing to pay for it. Um, so in 2020, we received that new construction start, and that's, as I said, solid gold. In 2020, we signed a cost share agreement with the U.S. Army Corps. At the time, the total project cost was estimated at $60 million. And at the time, so Senator Angles, to your question, the match rates were 50% for the planning and then 35% for design and construction. So 50-50 for the work that Ben has described all the way up to date. Now, as we segue into design, it, it would have been 35%, 65%. So in the 2022 WERDA, which has passed and was signed by the president, we achieved, we obtained a match rate adjustment and we brought that match rate down to the match rate that existed when the state partnered with the federal government back in 1935 to build this thing. And we got 7.1%. That's great. What that means, you know, anyone can do the math, but if it's a $100 million project, the state's maximum exposure is, uh, there's $100 million of federal money there, you know, about 7.1 million. Um, so obviously if the feds never gave us another dollar, then we've got a conversation to have, uh, you've got a conversation to have, but we are actively working on getting additional dollars. And so that happens in two steps. So first, first is to lift the authorization. 
Uh, Senator Sanders' team is working on that for us right now. The committee has the authorization lift request to bring the authorization to $100 million. So that's with committee now. That's what I think we'll get out of WERDA for this cycle. Um, that's what they communicated to me. And, um, and just for what it's worth, I communicated with the senator's staff on this just today to provide these same numbers to him. Uh, Ethan Hinch is his name. So then the next step will be, of course, to get some appropriations against that authorization. We all know what the appropriating environment looks like right now. And so I, I, I take no position on that. Obviously, it's, it is what it is. Uh, but our delegation absolutely knows the need. And so just to kind of summarize where we are right now, so we have $40 million of federal money in the bank. We have $4.5 million in the cash fund from your committee's work in the bank. We have an additional 150,000 residual in match money for the design work that has yet to be spent with the core. I think those numbers are right there. Okay, right. So 44.65 is in the bank. So we're a little over halfway there. If we receive additional federal dollars, and I'm hopeful that we do, and we are working on it all the way up, but, but, you know, we've done this briefing for Governor Scott. He's aware. Uh, Secretary Moore is clearly aware. They communicate at different levels than I get the opportunity to, right? But um, so everyone's aware of the, the need. And in process, as I said, right now, live legislating at the federal level is that authorization lift. And then I, you know, I have, we have to trust the senators and the representative ballot to do the budget work for the appropriation. Um, we have more match than we need for that $40 million, given the 7.1% adjustment. So I think we've got enough match to take on $60 million. I think, Eric, that's right. We have enough match to take on $60 million. That's why we came to you last year looking for that money in the cash fund. Um, so we'd we'll just argue, let's keep it there and, and, and keep, the, keep the pedal down uh, with the delegation on trying to get this fully funded. So I'm confused in terms of what our specific share amount is. The planning was 50-50. Mm -hmm. The design and construction, 35% state match? It was. It was. It was. It's, so where, how does that 7.1 play into that? So what happens is the way the, the, way the language uh, was put into 2022 Word Up is it retroactively adjusted the match rate to 7.1 for the entire project. Now, that's cool. That's our interpretation of it. We await U.S. Army Corps of Engineers guidance. Um, which is their turn for figuring it out for themselves, right? And letting us know. Um, but what, what has been communicated to us by our project uh, colleagues over there is they view that match rate adjustment as retroactive to the start of the project. We had pretty much felt we were getting a great deal if we did 50-50 on the, on, the, on the planning to date, and then the 7.1 was looked forward. But that's what we heard. Yes, in fact, the record here flat. Uh, uh, you know, they, they've actually made indications that that could extend back to even the earlier. Oh. But one other thing I just wanted to add, I think it was um, uh, mentioned uh, the money being dispersed over a period of time, and that's true. But the one thing that the court has told us is that they won't put the project out to bid unless all the money is in place. All right, that's why we front loaded it. Wayne and then Mary. So 40, 40 million from 2020, 4.65 capital funds. So you mentioned number that the smaller number. What was that a smaller number? Yeah, so the four and a half is in that cash fund right now, the capital cash fund, and then 150,000 or so that we haven't yet spent from yeah. prior yeah. capital okay. appropriations. So it's, it's part of this. It's yes, hasn't been yep. spent. Okay, so now the um the hundred million that could come in twenty twenty four, that'll be on top. So, so you would get all of that hundred million. So you'd have one hundred and forty, one hundred and forty, mm -hmm. almost one hundred fifty million dollars. No, so the, the hundred million would cover the project. Yeah, the hundred million dollars is the the authorization ceiling. So okay. in the federal statute, you know, they they have authorizations mm -hmm. and then they they plus the appropriation up to that ceiling. So we got already got. <clears throat> 
they've already appropriated 40 million. Correct. So the 100 should be six, actually 60 million right. appropriated. Exactly, right. exactly. And that is fundamentally, we are after somewhere between 50 and 60. So. <clears throat> Mary, Victoria, so, did you move your hand up? No. So when will you likely know what you're interpreting the 7.1% and all of that is? When will you actually know if that is actually what it is? Eric, do you have a sense from your discussions with Barbara? There's no set date. So we are just in kind of like regular communication with our contact with the agency. Yes, um, they've not specified a date, but they make sense. Uh, that's pretty difficult for us to be kind of not understanding exactly what these numbers mean to be able to help. I mean, want to do what we can, obviously, but if it's something different than that. I, I, I'd offer that sort of where we are now is um, we know we need more federal money right. and we have the money we need to, to continue with the design work where our agreements are signed, the work, the team is there, Ben right. is leading. No, I, you're doing yep. everything wonderfully, but we've got to, to shore in getting the money. And we're, you're, it's kind of a guess what the 7.1 is, is not probably feeling overly comfortable because we've got to get the money to do this project. Is there a way that we can push or would our um, federal folks have a better idea or able to get the, that information? Um, okay. Yeah, I, I actually, I would say yes, uh, the, the core tends to be responsive to inquiries of the senators, um, certainly in the past when we felt like they weren't operating uh, very quickly. Um, they, you know, Senator Leahy was particularly effective. We could ask, I'd, I'd love to just continue to keep the committee apprised of what's happening and maybe not take that step just yet. Um, it, it, you know, things feel from a sort of an organizationally, politically, all the, the Things seem like they're in a reasonable place right now, I think. Well, and my wish is that it will continue. Um, absolutely keep that in mind. We will we will continue to put a pin on, on that. Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I think it goes to Eric, and if I'm understanding the chronology here, the construction part doesn't start till 2027, correct? So if we were to bond out, and, and you mentioned that the core needs the money, in essence, in the bank before the construction. Okay. So I think there might be a way to get to that point by the time they actually mm -hmm. want to put a shovel on the ground without doing anything more than bond. So that leads into where I was thinking. If we went back to the um, page eight, which goes, that's the project steps. We have enough money right now to get us through 24, which is design and cost estimate. And we have enough money to get us through the upcoming design between 25 and 27. So, and that doesn't include the 4.5 million. Do we put in the cash fund or does it? It, it might yeah. include a little bit. Yes. Yes. Three. Yeah. Fine. Yes. Yeah. It, it would include a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah. How much is a little bit? Right, let's, <laughs> right, I'm going to go backwards a little bit on this. So if we assume if we get the 7%, then we probably have, we have right. enough. It changes the numbers totally. Uh, I think it's about 2.7 2. 7 million worth of design. I think it's about half the design phase. If without using the cash, but, uh, that's assuming 7%. A worst case scenario, 35% like max. And as you've seen, that's sort of, that's the standard max for design and construction. Um, we're pretty optimistic that they're going to agree to the second. Don't the chickens before they're hatched. <laughs> yeah. we're pretty optimistic about it, uh, but we don't have that sort of signature on the document. That's an important piece. The federal language essentially says that the match rate for this project is adjusted to the match rate in effect at the time the project was first constructed. And we have a lot of historical documentation that takes us to that 7.1%. And the court has it. Words such as notwithstanding. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, it starts with notwithstanding because it notwithstanding is the 35%, thank goodness, right? So hopefully there's not two notwithstandings in that one clause. Is it um, standard practice to have facilities on there like Green Mountain Power that don't pay a rent on these dams? I mean, what, I'm not looking for them to be able to bump up, but just future, you know, we're probably not the last dam we ever built and probably not the last thing that we go. So um, uh, what's what's the standard practice with that? Uh, we do have a license agreement with the rights We do, yeah. We'll talk so, about that a little bit. We have two facilities that have hydropower associated with them. This one here, which Green Mountain Power has kind of been partner since day one. So they're, they're sort of in that regard. Other facility that has it is Riceville right over here, which we, we have we have an easement with um, Washington Electric who runs that hydropower facility. We do have um, we do have a, an easement with them that is in need of being updated because they just got a new FERC license. Um, they the past agreement required them to pay, I believe, ten thousand uh, dollars, and they paid that to the Beach District for recreational purposes. The state didn't actually get any money. We proposed, I guess we can say we proposed a uptick in that perhaps some coming this way, but um, that's still negotiation. So. Right now, we have enough money in the bank. I'm basing it on 35% to get us through the design documents from 25 to 27. So those are calendar years. So you're talking FY26 and FY27 capital budgets. So next year. Really talking about when we, the rubber really hits the road that we need to actually find the money. But right now, with a 4.5 that we put aside for cash in the cash fund for this, and then the previous appropriations we've done in the capital bill over the years, there's enough in the bank to get us through that design documents to 27, which then gets into the construction during the summer of 27. So we're just in a holding pattern at this point. So what, in terms of the money, this is giving us a heads yep. up. This is exactly. So what's down the spillway? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, we, we wanted to make sure that you continued to have the most up-to-date information. <laughs> We've been visiting with you about this project for some time, but it is, as you see, it's getting real and it's really, it, it has produced some tangible immediate outcomes. The, the risk reduction work that Ben is doing now, $750,000 or so of work, super important, allows him to operate the dam the way it needs to be operated. <laughs> when it's done, it's gonna be a different landscape up there. And, and uh, we just need to get it to keep him around. If this dam didn't exist and we're looking at it, what, like back up, what's the uh, next highest risk dam in, that we own? So, that we would be looking at. Um, right, so right, Phil, and East Barry are three vertical control dams that mm -hmm. highest. Okay. And I guess where my thoughts are going are that this won't be done until we're going to probably bond most of the money, which is 20 years out. How many more we're going to lay on top of it? Probably, it's probably not an answerable question at the moment. No, it's not. But I think we need to keep that in the back of our mind. This isn't the dam. So the best case scenario for us is the lucky seven. <laughs> and if not, then we're looking at how much more state share at that 35 percent from so that would be let's call it 100 if you call it a 100 million dollar project there 35 million right, minus the four and a half yep. that we already have so we'll be looking at 31 million dollars for two years two-year capital budget i, don't know, I understand let's that 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 we worked hard for that match rate adjustment have um, you heard any contrary interpretation no. of that 7.1? No. 
No. And, and in fact, just to be clear, the delegation worked hard for that. And I think if the, if the Corps were to come back with something that deviated substantially based on the historic record that we provided everybody, I think that they would probably have something to say about it. And that's an administrative decision from the Army Corps. It would not be, you know, it's, it's clear in statute what they want. Yeah. So. And where were we at with the other two dams? Similar, 7.1? The no, the other dams are uh, 50, 50, 35, 65. Okay. Those are the, yeah, because no, that right, match right. rate adjustment was specific to Waterbury. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So, so, by the way, something they also are now aware of because of the floods and the pressures that uh, Wrightsville faced. Yeah. So they, mm -hmm. they do know the value of a match rate adjustment across 1177 for all of the dams. For context, there are four dams in the United States that are eligible under 1177, and three of them are in Vermont, and one, the California one, I believe no longer exists. So, wow. I'm always special. Senator Leahy was pretty <laughs> slick. Who's yes, yes, the other two? Uh, Wrightsville and East Perry. Right. And it would go back to, it wouldn't necessarily be 7.1%, it would go back to the, the initiation of those projects, right? That's correct. Representative, yeah. that's right. And I don't know what we have for records on those ones. But so I just want some clarity because we've been putting money into this for a while. 22, 23, we put in 1.5 million, where some of that I think probably went into some of the work you've done right now. But last year we were told 4.5 million would complete would be enough to complete the project for a match. That's not 35% of the 60. No, and the reason, uh, Madam Chair, is because we had obtained that 2022 match rate adjustment at that time. The 7.1, so it has changed, even though you had been approved at that point? No, we just haven't risked. The only, the only uncertainty around the 7.1% the is the Army Corps putting their final stamp of administrative approval on their understanding of what the statutory language says? Our delegation knows it's seven point one percent. We know it's seven point one percent. The Corps that's, staff know it's seven point one percent. That's what the four point five million was based on. Exactly. We wanted to get us up to the sixty million dollars we thought this project was going to cost based on our our best estimates from last year to the year before. So now we're bumping up to close to 90 million possibly 79 so you're still going to need even at the seven percent you're still going to need more money but it's going to be what three 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 million, point, three another three million three yeah. and a half million over two years versus 31. it's a good investment you will not appear. no not necessarily <laughs> I have my, yeah, I have my faith serious. in you. Um, I think it's worth also kind of reinforcing the notion that the core actually offered, you know, they were surmising that that same percentage could be retroactively yeah. applied to the you know, work we already done. So I think the staff that we're working with at the core uh, sort of agree that the, the, the 7.1 percent is likely to so we still don't know that retroactivity to further back in terms of the design no, documents I think we felt who well, knows maybe they will in the end but of course that means there's a little less money available overall for the project so it's, there's a balancing act here but if, it, if they do agree i just want to follow eric and friday afternoon is tough <laughs> um <laughs> So if they did agree with a 7.1 and it's retroactive, it would go back to the design work that we have done, mm -hmm. which then means some of the match that we had there, because that was 50-50, right. would not all be used up on right. state share, which would then go towards the ultimate construction. Right. Of the exactly correct. that match. It was a little less than one and a half, but the um, total cost is $3 million, match one and a half. The reason why we've got a little bit more than the four and a half million is because they actually got started a little bit ahead of us. Um, okay. So we had to use some previous appropriation to make that initial amount of that, about under a couple hundred thousand. That's why we actually have that right. 1 point, uh, 190 some odd thousand balance. This is an appropriation FY23 to 
pardon me, seven hundred thousand dollar reduction. The second half of an average to study. Tax on all we will we will keep the committees apprised. Thank you. Will. Thank you. <laughs> so nothing for this next fiscal year is on the radar for FY26 and 27. So whoever's sitting around the table here next January, good luck. Well. <laughs> Anything else for folks? Commissioner, did you want to have anything to say? Only to say thank you. And this is obviously big. It is um, not fully funded yet. Um, and 2027 is a big date. Thank you all for Just hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been very helpful. Thank you. Are you in the list? Good job.